God bless you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It is Thursday night, and I'm glad to be able to be back for Thursday night Bible study. I am Apostle Dr. Dawn Nickel Manning, where and God has given me the strength to make it down to the course of this day and to be able to share the word of God with those of you who have an ear to hear. Um, I invite you to go ahead and get your Bibles, your notepads, your pens so that you can take notes. I always advise everyone to write down whatever notes in the scriptures that are being read so that you can go back and you can study on your own and ask God for a personal divine revelation so that he can impart into you whatever it is that needs to be added on to from the lesson to meet you personally where you need to be met. So God bless you. And if you would just join me in prayer, Father, we just thank you and praise you. We give you honor and glory for this opportunity and this time as we go into your word. We ask that you take out all distractions. Lord, we pray right now, first and foremost, that you will forgive us of, our, of any wrongdoing, any sin, any uh, sin of omission or commission, creating us a clean heart, renew the right spirit, because we want to be able to come and read your word, Father God, with holy hands, with a pure heart and clear thought, Father God so that you can speak to us divinely in the name of Jesus. Father God, I pray right now, Lord, that those who have an ear to hear that the word will do what it needs to do to help them, to lift them up, to edify them, to encourage them to continue the run, the course, Father God. Oh God, pressing toward the mark of the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. Lord, I thank you and I praise you for this time and moment. And Lord, once again, open up our understanding to receive what you are saying in Jesus name. Amen. Glory to God in the highest. Bless be the name of the Lord. Tonight, I'm going to discuss about the miry dungeon. Turn with me to Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah, chapter 38. Jeremiah, chapter 38. And I want to talk about the miry dungeon being in the miry dungeon, but understanding God has a rescue plan. I want us to go into what the situation was first, what was going on with Jeremiah. <clears throat> if you read the at the top of uh, the chapter, uh, it basically goes into Jeremiah doing what God called him to do. He basically gave a word to um, the designated group of people that God told him to speak to. If you read um, uh, the first verse, it tells you in 38, then uh, Sephatiah, the son of Matin, and Gedaliah, the son of Peshur, and Jew, called the son of Shalema, and pursued the son of Malchiah, heard the words that Jeremiah had spoken unto the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, he that remaineth in this city shall die by the sword, but the famine, by the famine and by the pestilence, but he that goeth forth to the Chaldeans shall live. But he shall have his life for a prey and shall live. Thus saith the Lord, this city shall surely be given unto the hand of the king of Babylon's army, which shall take it. Therefore, the princess said unto the king, we beseech ye, let this man be put to death. For thus he weakeneth the hands of the men of war that remain in the city and the hands of all the people in speaking such words unto them. For this man seeketh not the welfare of this people, but the hurt. So basically, they were mad at the word that Jeremiah delivered delivered because they, they didn't, first of all, they didn't want to give themselves over to anybody. They had, you know, they had their ego. They were pious about who they were as a people and they wanted to stay where they were and they wanted to fight and they felt that they would win the battle. But Jeremiah was letting them know, look, you can't stay here because if you stay here, you're going to become captives. You're going to, you're going to become captives to the enemies. But if you take the other route and you allow for yourselves to be given over to the Chaldeans, you'll, you'll live, you'll survive. They didn't want to hear that. And because it was a message that they didn't want to hear, they wanted to kill Jeremiah. You know, some of us are put into situations where people want to kill us because we're the messenger. They want to kill us because we're shining and we're showing forth the light. We're showing forth love. We're showing forth kindness. And some people, they just don't like the message that you bring, whether it's vocal or whether it's through your actions and deeds. They are not, everyone is not going to always be happy about who you are and the gift that you carry. Let me tell you something. 
When people say, oh, I want to be a prophet, let me tell you, being a prophet is not a pretty job. Any person that says, oh, I want to be a prophet and I want to go into the prophetic ministry. Yes, it's a it's a blessing. It's a, it's great to have that desire, but you have to know what you are getting into because much given much required. OK, when that, that gift within itself, it brings you have to understand from the beginning being prophetic. Given prophetic words, having the uh, uh, the understanding of, of, of the gift of prophecy and walking and the role of being a prophet or a prophetess, it requires much. And there has to be an understanding that you will be persecuted because a lot of the times when you say things, people are not going to be happy with what you are saying. Sometimes people think that the gift of prophecy is like, oh, I can, you know, I can say this and I can speak this over someone's life and this, that, and other. It's more than that. You have to come, you have to be able to be prepared to whatever comes with what you say. Some people may receive it. Some people may not. And the may nots are the ones that you, you have to be very strong in your stance and what you know and who you know, because they will, in, in a sense, whether it's through their words or whether it's physically, they will w- want to tear you down. They would want to beat you up. They would want to kill you. You can see that right here in verse 38. They did not want to hear what Jeremiah was saying. Operating in the prophetic will sometimes cause for you to be put in a miry pit. Speaking words that will give enlightenment. Uh, that will help people to get to a better destination because they may want to go straight, but you may come and you may tell, listen, I understand that that straight way, it looks easier, but it, but if you go through the winding woods, you're going to be able to escape a lot of stumbling blocks. Some people, they don't understand that they hear the word woods. And they hear, oh, the woods, it's going to be a whole bunch of trees. It might be poison ivy. It's going, it might be wild animals. So their mind goes off to the far deep end. And they're not understanding that you're being used as a vessel of God to, to show them, yes, it may not look like an easy path, but it's actually the best plan because it's going to get you through where you will not have to go through so much turmoil. See, but people, they say, look, I like the straight way. It's a paved road. There's nothing, you know, from from what I see when I look down that paved road, it's clear and I can get down. See, but they don't they don't see all the way further down that that road may have some blocks, that that road may have some uh, 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 so, uh, uh, um, some holes in the, some potholes. See, they don't see that far ahead. See, but when, when the Lord uses a prophet, they see beyond those things. And that's why they're not always, the message that they give is not always a message that's going to make people feel happy because people are happy with the familiar, with what they know. The majority of the time when a prophecy is going forth, it's out of the familiar. It takes you out of your com- comfort zone. So prophets, they have a they have a sole responsibility to be obedient to the voice of God and the delivery that they're supposed to give forth to whoever God commissions them to speak to. And then they also have to be aware of the fact that they will be persecuted at any given time and moment for the words that they may speak that comes from one high. So for those of you who are saying, well, I want to be a prophet, I want to be a, a prophesy this, that... It's not just about telling somebody, oh, you're going to get a car and a house. When God tells you to speak and tell, tell you to move and go and go somewhere to tell somebody to come out of their riches or come out of their fame or they will surely die. That's that's a hard message because people don't want to hear nothing about, oh, I'm going to die. They feel they live in the life. They have money, cars, this, that, and the other. Now here you come talking about, oh, if they don't come out of that, they're going to surely die. They're not going to want to hear that. So you got to be careful. You have to be careful and you have to have the understanding. God wants us to have the understanding, the full understanding of the things that we walk into. If you're, you have to have a thick skin to be a true prophet of God. You have to have thick skin. You have to be willing. You have to be willing to be persecuted. It comes with the territory. I know somebody out there saying, oh, that's crazy. This and the other. Yeah, because true prophets aren't those ones that's always talking about riches, fame, and glory. 
True, true prophets get down to the nitty gritties. And like I said, they're going to tell you things that you don't necessarily want to hear. But in the end run, what they're saying to you is going to be beneficial and helpful to your life. Okay, let's continue on. So once again, verse four, we see that they wanted uh, the king to put uh, Jeremiah to death. Verse five says, then Zedekiah, the king said, behold, he is in your hand for the king is not he that can do anything against you. Then they took Jeremiah and cast him into the dungeon of Melchiah, the son of Hamalek, that was in the court of the prison. And they let down Jeremiah with cords. And in the dungeon, there was no water, but mire. So Jeremiah sunk in the mire. What is mire? Mire is when there's uh, when soil becomes murky, it becomes swampy. Um, it can become nasty. Some miry pits can act even have uh, feces in it. Miry pits can be uh, have debris in it from dead carcasses. Uh, miry um, pits can be uh, 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 just uh, just soil that has been contaminated that you can't stand on it. It's not solid. It, it's it's not something that you 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 feel yourself sinking in it. It's not it's not a firm foundation and it's very miserable to try to keep yourself up and alive on 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 a uh, 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 miry uh, uh, material or miry land just imagine he wasn't in a place like where he could at least hold on to some uh trees to get some release or whatever he was put in a pit so there was there was probably just in that pit if, uh, the way I'm imagining it, if they if they lowered him down it was similar to lowering him down into a desolate well a well you know a well a water well and they lowered him down there and they left him down near the rock they left him for dead they didn't give him any food they didn't give him any water they were not concerned about Jeremiah let me tell you something as a, as being a prophet People are not going to be concerned about your well-being because I got to clear this thing up about people acting as if the, the role of a prophet is a shiny life. It's a glorious life. And, you know, it's a fancy life because I'm seeing these things and, and I'm just saying this is not of God, you know, because when you read about true prophets, prophets have gone through a thing or two. They're not riding around in big fancy cars. They're not flashing, you know, um, fine jewelry. And they're not, you know, you know, oh, look at me in my fur coat. That's not what prophets do. Prophets have some, for the most part, some prophets go through some real hardship. And it's not because of God saying that you have to suffer. It's because of man. Because man does not want to hear what God has to say in their carnal state of mind. Whenever anyone listens to a prophet, it's because they have subjected themselves to be led by the spirit. They have humbled themselves to crucify their flesh, to have an ear, to hear, recognizing that that person is speaking on behalf of the Lord God. So they humble themselves. So therefore, that's why, you know, when you see a, a, a someone listening to a prophet, that prophet is, you know, oh, thank God they listen. They're happy that they're list they listen. But for the most part, when people don't want to hear, once again, what that prophet is saying, they're going to want to condition them to a, a place that's uncomfortable. So you see here in the book of, of Jeremiah, as it's written, it's a miry dungeon. Today, people are trying to isolate you. They'll they'll try to talk about you and manipulate other people to turn against you, to despise you. And they'll try to make you feel isolated as if you're on, on, on alone. And sometimes you're in a place, it, it's just like being in a miry dungeon where you feel like I can't move. I don't have a foundation. And you're trying, you're <laughs> trying to pull up against so it. There's no, nothing to pull on. It's nothing to get to that place where you feel like I can get out of here. You just simply feel stuck. And that's a lot of, once again, that's a lot of the time how prophets feel. If they be honest, I'm talking about the real prophets out there. If they be honest, sometimes they feel like they're stuck, like they can't get out. See, but they have an understanding and they have such a great connection with the Heavenly Father that even while they are in their miry conditions, when they're in those types of sicky conditions, when they're in those uncomfortable conditions, they rely on God to see them through. And see, that's what you have to do even as a believer. Let's... 
outside of the role of being a prophet, you have to get in a place in God that when things are uncomfortable and things you just don't understand, why is it this way? I, Lord, I'm trying to pull myself out. There's no one coming this way. They left me in this pit to rot with no concern for me or my soul, my body, nothing. I trust in you. Some of you all are in positions where you're on a job or you're in even sometimes in your family. You may feel as if you are the one that's the black sheep. No matter what you do, you are considered wrong. No matter what you do, all of your good, all of your good is looked at as being negative. You can give the shirt off of your back. It's still considered to be wrong because why? You are in a miry dungeon. But let me tell you something. God always has a rescue plan for his children. God always has a rescue plan for those of us who trust in him, for those of us who are obedient. Yes, there's going to be some times we may go through. Yes, there's going to be some tumultuous situations that we have to deal with. But when you have your faith and your trust in God, he's going to make sure that he's going to rescue you out of that situation. OK, let's see. How? Huh. Where will you see that at? Where's the rescue plan? Let's look, look, look. Let's look at it. We already talked about in verse six. I'll read over again. Let's read, read verse six. It says they took Jeremiah, cast him into the dungeon of Malchiah, the son of Hamalek, that was in the court of the prison. And they let down Jeremiah with cords. And in the dungeon, there was no water but mire. So Jeremiah sunk in the mire. Now, whenever met Abed Malek, the Ethiopian, one of the eunuchs, which was the, in the king's house, heard that they had put Jeremiah in the dungeon. The king then sitting in the gate of Benjamin, Abedmelech went forth out of the king's house and spake to the king, saying, My lord, the king, these men have done evil in all that they have done to Jeremiah the prophet, whom they have cast into the dungeon, and is like to die for hunger in the place where he is. For there is no more bread in the city. Then the king commanded, commanded Abedmelech the Ethiopian, saying, Take from, him, from hence thirty men with thee, and take up Jeremiah the prophet out of the dungeon before he dies. So Abedmelech took the men with him and went into the house of the king under the treasury and took thence old cast clouts and old rotten rags and let them down by cords into the dungeon to Jeremiah. Let, let me stop right there. Let me stop right there. Now we can see Jer Jeremiah, he was in the dungeon, but someone got a word. Someone who knew of, Jer uh, of Jeremiah and knew that Jeremiah was a prophet and knew that he was a messenger of God. God is always going to mark somebody that's going to notice the good works in you. God is always going to have somebody. You may not know who that person is, but there's always somebody watching you and they are sitting back and admire you. They are awing at the fact of the work that you are doing. It may be people talking. That person may feel like, let me shut my mouth. I don't want to say anything because I don't want anybody to come crucify me because I'm giving compliments or accolades to the prophet. I don't want anybody coming after me, you know, wanting to beat me up because I said something positive about the prophet. I don't want anybody coming and starting to talk about me and start, uh, you know, despising me and trying to set me up and sabotage me because I said something good about the child of God. Always remember, God has someone who has an eye on you that notices the good things that you do, that notices the fact that you live a life that is holy and righteous, that notice that you have a loving, kind spirit. They have took it into consideration. They have seen what you said. They have seen you in operation. They have noticed your works. They may not say anything. They may not ever say anything to your face, but when the time arrives, God will get that individual to be the catalyst to your rescue plan. I'm, I'm here to tell you tonight through this lesson, stop worrying about the situation. 
Stop worrying about what it feels like. So we, as children of God, there was many a times we're going to face uncomfortable situations. When you are in an uncomfortable situation, know that God is on the way. It's going to last, but such a time, but it's not going to last always. And God is going to see you through, but you have to have a made up mind to understand the process. Always know that God has a rescue plan for you. So what did God do? He used this, that he used this messenger to go back to the king, to tell the king that they had Jeremiah in this pit. The king then commands that 30 men be sent out and they go and rescue Jeremiah. Now let's look at the rescue plan. It says that what the king commanded Abed Malek, the Ethiopian, this unit, they took him, hence 30 men with thee, and took uh, Jeremiah the prophet out of the dungeon before he died. So Abed Malek took the men with him and went into the house of the king under the treasury and took thence old cast clouts and old rotten rags. Cast clouts, if you are a centrist, uh, clouts are pieces of remnants of material. Right. That's their pieces of materials. So they found these pieces of materials and they got these old rotten rags and they had to twine them together to create cords to lower them down so that Jeremiah could have something to be pulled up on. And it says in verse 12, and Abed Malek, the Ethiopian said unto Jeremiah, put now these old cast clouts and rotten rags under thy iron holes, under the cords. And Jeremiah did so. Let me tell you something. Your rescue plan may not always look like a pretty helicopter. Your rescue plan may not look like a, a siren, a, a cop car coming in a black and white car with a uh, 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 with the uh, siren flashing back and forth. Sometimes your rescue plan going to look messed up and beat up, but you got to trust the process. <laughs> That God is going to bring you out. Though they didn't know, they didn't have anything. First of all, they probably didn't even know the con the real condition of what Jeremiah was dealing with. So if they were guards, they couldn't just put down their swords. How, how was he going to use a sword to pull himself up? But they had to find something that would get the job done. Sometimes when you are in a messy situation, the thing that's going to get the job done is going to be a messy, messy thing. Don't despise it. Let me tell you something. Why? What, what, she, what do you? Don't. Know, what do you mean by that? Sometimes God gonna use messy people to come to your rescue. Yeah. See, the very person that's messy who keeps saying things about you, they don't even realize that they're the cords that are actually pulling you up. We all know what the word says. He said that he would make our enemies what? Our footstool. What is a footstool? A footstool. I know my mother used to have one by her bed because her bed used to be high. And she would used to step on that a footstool to allow for herself to get into the bed a little bit more easier. So that's what that's what enemies do. They become your footstool so that you can step into the next thing that you have to go go towards a little bit more easier. See, so the, the messy, the plan may look like a messy rescue plan, but it's getting the job done. Those old clouts and those old uh, rags that was lowered down, they, they said, put them under your arm. Jeremiah, put it under your arm. So when you put it under your arm, when you wrap it under, they would be able to lift Jeremiah up out of that miry pit. God is going to use things. That you may feel is strange. You may come up against some people and say, this person has been making my life miserable over the last three, five, ten years. And now here they come smiling in my face. And now here they come trying to, you know, be manipulative and get one. Trust the process. They don't even realize it, that God is using those old clots, those old clouts, those old rags. <laughs> That's what they are. You got to look at some, when people start acting messy around you and they start doing things around you and they, you, you know, sometimes I have people, they know, they know I'm a minister and they'll cuss on purpose. Now I have some people, they'll come around me and they slip up. They say a cuss word. They say, oh, 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 I'm so sorry. I don't mean to cuss around you. I know you're a pastor. I apologize. I just, but you have some people, they intentionally just do it on purpose, knowing who you are because they don't respect the God in you. See, they be, they be thinking they're hurting you. They're not hurting you. They're disrespecting God. And see, the word says, touch not thy anointed, do thy prophet no harm. And a lot of people don't know today that when they are dealing with people of God who are truly living their life 
in a way to be pleasing in the sight of God, when you say things against them, when you disrespect them, those people don't even realize some of the sicknesses that come upon their body. Some of the calamities that hit their doorstep is because they disrespected a servant of God because they don't realize that they're actually disrespecting the God on the inside of that servant. So when you disrespect God, you got to ex- you got to reap the consequences. And if you never come to a place of repentance, that's why so, that's why it's important when you know you come short of the glory to repent. When you know that you said something or did something wrong to some someone, get it right. Because so you're going to reap what you sow. And if you never come into a place that said, oh, I did something to hurt or to offend, you can be walking around and every time, wait a minute, why my, my, why my paycheck always short? Wait a minute. Why am I, why, why, why my administrator always down my back? Why is it that my, my, my child is always, you know, uh, every, every time I turn around, they got the flu. They got hay fever. They got a sore throat. I'm telling you. Some of these things we allow to come upon ourselves because we don't reverence the God on the instruments and the vessels that he had placed in this world to be a benefit to us. And so we become the people, people start to start to work around you and they start to do disrespectful things. They start to do things that are, 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 are mean, that are malicious. Understand all of that is a part of the plan. God is slowly but surely the right measure, the right time. Though all of those things that are around you, those old clouds, those dirty rags, they're all eventually going to pull you up out of the pit to get you set free to go to the next level where God is leading you to go. Don't, don't, for whatever you do, don't start murmuring and complaining about the challenges that are around you. Because when we start murmuring and complaining, we actually allow for ourselves to to actually stay in it longer. Because of Jeremiah and the way Jeremiah has been spoken of, I don't know, it doesn't specifically say how long he was in that pit, but I know that Jeremiah, because he knew who God was, that he knew that God was going to rescue him. And in his patience, in his long suffering, in his obedience, he dealt with the mire. And then when it was time for him to be rescued, he didn't look at those old rags and cloths and say, what are y'all crazy? Y'all long, what? Nope. He followed the instructions. Abed-Melech said, put them under your arms. And when he put them under his arms, they were able to draw him out. Verse 18, um, excuse me, verse 13 says, so they drew up Jeremiah with cords and took him up out of the dungeon and Jeremiah remained into the court of the prison. Meaning that he got out of the pit. Now, you know, the, the, the system, he, that was torture being in that pit. He was still in the system because it was still a work that he had to be, had to get done, but he was no longer in that miry dungeon. And that's, that's what God gave me to tell you all today. For those of you who have an ear that you're going to go through some things. Some of you all are feeling like you're in a, a, a murky place, a, a sticky situation, but God is going to bring you out. And God is going to even use some rotten people to be the cords that's going to lift you up so that you can get to the next level. Be not dismayed. Put your hope and your trust in the Lord. There's a rescue plan for each and every one of us when we get into those hard situations. Trust and believe that God is going to see you through. I pray that this word met you where you needed to be met. Until we meet or speak again, may the blessing of the Lord continue to make you rich, adding no sorrow to it.